You're listening to Radio VR, the voice of Russia in London with me, Juliet Speth. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UK received 23,499 new applications for asylum in the year ending in June 2013. In the UK, an asylum seeker is someone who has asked the government for refugee status and is waiting to hear the outcome of their application. A refugee is defined as a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his or her nationality and is unable to, or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country. As of the beginning of 2012, the population of refugees pending asylum cases and stateless persons made up 0.27 of the population of the UK. That's 149,765 refugees, just over 18,000 pending asylum cases and 205 stateless persons. A new report called 28 Days Later, The Experiences of New Refugees in the UK examines the transition period between when someone is granted refugee status and their asylum support ends. Today, an adult asylum seeker has to survive on £5.23 per day, which leaves many asylum seekers missing meals and unable to buy food. So what is life like being a refugee in Britain today? I'm joined by Kuka Ivo, an asylum seeker from Cameroon who spent four months in detention and is now a student at St Patrick's College studying health and social care. Dr Lisa Dorr from the British Refugee Council and author of the report 28 Days Later, The Experiences of New Refugees in the UK, and Dr Victoria Canning, lecturer in criminology at Liverpool John Moores University and coordinator of the Prisons Punishment and Detention Group at the European Group for the Study of Deviance and Social Control. Kuku Ivu. We're very grateful that you've agreed to come in to share your experience of coming to Britain. You're most welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Would you start then by talking through your experience of coming to Britain as an asylum seeker waiting for refugee status? Yeah, thank you for giving me the chance to say what I know about the refugee system in the UK, which I've been, I've been through for a while. I left my country uh, because of the problems I was facing back home. So Britain was, uh, I knew, we knew in Cameroon that Britain was uh, it's, uh, like uh, the, country, the country that colonized Cameroon, southern Cameroon. So it's just like our mother or where we have to seek refuge. So I struggled to leave the country and find myself in Britain where I seek as I ask for protection from the British government. But uh, unfortunately, the day I asked for the protection, I was, uh, I was detained that same day. So I went through the process for a period of four months. After release, I had to go through some uh, another period for about two months before having my uh, refugee status as from release to my refugee status i was going to court so i had to go through the period for about six months before actually being receiving the refugee status so within this period from detention to going to from detention going to court and having my status at the end of the day it's been uh, it's been a long long journey as i can say it's been really a long journey because i gone i've gone through a series of uh, problems as i can say from the very first day i went to croydon uh, i started witnessing that it was uh, you just lose your your rights in uk just for seeking asylum for asking for protection in the uk you automatically lose your rights, your human rights. So, because right from Croydon, I was being kept in a, in, a, in, a, in a cell, as I can say. When I asked for protection, the, the lady interviewed me, and a few hours later, I found myself in a locked, confined room, which I was uh, later the day taken to Hammondsworth, where I spent four months. And from Hamosworth, I was taken to 
one prison in, in Hustler, south of London, Portsmouth, where I spent some few days and from there I was released. I was released to uh, an accommodation that is uh, managed by one organization and we, we were sharing the accommodation, seven of us in that in the accommodation and I was on a fee on, uh, I think they were giving me 35 pounds a week. And from there were other friends that uh, were living together, they were having but vouchers. Vouchers that you have to use only in uh, specific stores. You don't use them anywhere. So if you need something, if you need an item that you can't find them in that, in that shop, so you are nowhere to be found. You have to do it the other way because the voucher is, you don't change it for money. You only collect items from the designated stores. All these things have uh, made me, I think I really need to campaign, I really need to raise awareness to the authorities if uh, some of these things could be changed, and if not all, but some really should be touched and, and changed for the better of those who are still in the process. What would you change the most? Not me changing. So I would propose that the authorities concerned, uh, just a recap, what a fortnight ago there was a strike in uh, Hammersworth and uh, the detainees were, uh, they were striking that the fast track process should be abolished. And that's the most the serious issue about this, uh, the detention process, the fast track, uh, fast track process. You have been placed uh, in the fast track process. You have no time to produce any evidence to support your claim. The solicitor, the duty solicitor in charge of a claim has no time to study your, your claim. So there's that confusion that at the end of the day, the determination of a claim is not just. So if the fast track process is abolished, that would be good for any person seeking asylum in the UK, any person speak, seeking refuge in the UK, shouldn't be put in the detained fast track. There should be alternative measures in place of the detention, the detained fast track. Uh, and what was um, day-to-day life like in the detention centre? Uh, my first day in detention, I, I wept because uh, I've been in prison first in Cameroon, my home country, and when I discovered that I'm in detention here, I just started thinking of what was happening back home when I was in, the, in prison. So I thought all those type of things would happen to me. So I was really, really depressed those, those times. But I met friends who've been there for some time. I m- came in contact with new friends and I had to ask them how they've been living in detention. They explained certain things to me, how they go through. So what really made me go through this was... Uh, that uh, I that determination to achieve my uh, what do I say my my protection to go right up to the end. So I had that zeal, I had that determination to fight right up to the end. So I engaged myself in doing some sports in detention that kept me up. I applied to work in the kitchen. That throughout the day I was busy, so I had no time to be thinking too much about it. The only time I I used to think about all those uh, negative thoughts, all those things, were when I come back to my room at night, I'll start thinking, what would happen? Are they going to remove me back to Cameroon? Those were the hard moments. But my day-to-day life, I will go to the gym, come back, go to the restaurant, help in preparing the food for the detainees, come back, go back to the, come back from the restaurant, go to gym and and even I go back to my room. That was my daily life. But what I saw there from other detainees who don't, they, they don't have that, uh, they don't think like me. They were really, really depressed. And the bad thing was we are mixed with 
criminals. Not only asylum seekers are in detention, they are hard hardened criminals that are there and their children they are very they are young youngsters that are monsters. So I begin to think what will this what will this child learn from a hard hardened criminal? You see in a room you got three beds there, you have a criminal in that room and you have about a child of about seventeen, eighteen, nineteen years in it. What will what example will he learn from that criminal? So the outcome of it at the end is not good, really. So I witnessed this case. Uh, a detainee from uh, Sri Lanka was to be deported. The following day, we were at the playground, and he just got up, went to the wall, and hit him, his his head on the wall. And the head just opened, and blood started oozing out. All those stuff, things, witness fighting in detention. I myself, I've been, I've been attacked in Hammersworth I think two times. Just I managed to escape from all those stuff things, but a day-to-day life is not, it's not good at all in the detention center. Lisa Doyle, um, <clears throat> you're author of this report. Twenty-eight days later, the experiences of new refugees in the UK. How familiar a story is uh, is Cookers there to you? It's incredibly familiar. Um, at the Refugee Council, we have grave concerns about the use of immigration detention. Um, seeking asylum is not a crime, and there is no way that people should um, have their claims processed whilst being incarcerated. We have substantial concerns about the detained fast-track process, where we believe, uh, uh, as was just explained, that people don't have enough time to get the evidence together that they need to show that they are at risk of, of persecution um, if their asylum claim is not successful. And um, We need to think about the decisions that are made on people's asylum claims. These are life and death decisions. This is not just a, a normal administrative process about whether someone um, should get some money or, or those, those kinds of things that are often made by officials in who, who work for government. Um, you know, if you get a decision on an asylum claim wrong, then that can result in someone being removed and being at risk of persecution, torture, death on return to their home country. And we feel that you can't have space to have your asylum claim heard fairly in an accelerated process. What's, in, what's the benefit of an accelerated process for the government though? Um, the government's rationale for having detained fast track is that it's for cases they believe are easily resolvable. Um, so it, it, there are you know, people from particular countries that, that go through. But the, the grant rate, uh, the refugee grant rate in detained fast track is minuscule compared to that on asylum claims in general. Um, so we don't know whether people are entering detained fast track in because they're more easily removable. And I think that that could be an argument that they think that these should be straightforward. We know the, the situations in these countries of origin and therefore we can resolve the asylum case really quickly. But no two asylum claims are the same. It's a complex. It's difficult to evidence that you personally are subject to persecution and risk on return to the home country. Um, so detain fast track simply doesn't work. How, when you say, uh, they say easily resolvable asylum claims, I mean, what do they deem are easily resolvable? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's around what types of evidence they, they might think um, they, they will be able to have more readily at their fingertips. You know. um, there are certain countries where um, few asylum claims are successful, um, so people may be pushed through to attain fast track it, um, through that process. But our argument is that they're prejudging people's asylum claims. You cannot, on the face of someone showing up at, at Croydon and saying, I wish to claim for asylum, giving some answers to some very basic questions about where they've come from, what they're fleeing, and, and you know, some basic demographic graphic, graphic information, that the Home Office simply cannot say whether one case is more resolvable than another without the evidence being got together, without someone talking to their legal representative and being able to show their case properly. You mentioned, Kuka, about the detention centres almost being like a prison and you shared with a hardened criminal <laughs> so, yeah. or children, albeit teenagers. teenagers um, yeah. yeah, and there was... Uh, I, I've, I've got some figures in front of me that says in 2012... 
222 children were detained in immigration removal centres, with 156 being under the age of 11. I'll come to you uh, now, Dr Victoria Canning. Um, what legacy is this level of detention having on children? And I know you've done some some reports um, specifically looking at women in detention centres. I think detention in and of itself, incarceration in and of itself, has got the capacity to have very long-term impacts, um, psychosocial impacts, mental health impacts, psychological impacts on people who have been in incarcerated. Incarceration, again, detention in and of itself is a position where people are left quite often um, powerless in relation to the other people. You know, for example, the regime, prison guards, um, the centre um, and the institution and thus are put in quite, can be put in quite vulnerable positions as uh, I think Coco has just discussed really well. It also has the impact, and what my research has found is that detention and the asylum system more generally has the potential and the capacity to really compound the impacts of persecution, of trauma, of torture, of sexual violence. Um, and as Women for Refugee Women's recent report has just shown, the violences, as Coco's just discussed, assaults, for example, in uh, detention centres and verbal abuse or the threat of abuse or even even the, the the memory or fear or re-traumatisation of abuse that has has previously happened in detention. And if we keep in mind in relation to torture, quite often when torture is perpetrated, it is perpetrated in detention, in incarceration, um, in people's countries of origin. So therefore, there's, there's the capacity for long-term impacts of detention on women, men and children who are incarcerated in this country um, with, you know, with criminal charge, but also in this case, you know, without criminal charge. People who are in detention, in prison, without criminal charge in what is supposedly, uh, you know, a, a democracy. Do people in Britain really understand then the asylum system and refugee process? Uh, and would, you know, it, there are articles that are written and documentaries, but <clears throat> do people, did you, Keku, feel isolated or did you feel that anyone in Britain understood where you were living or what, what situation you were in? I got a key a case worker that my case was attributed to him. So that person represented the home office and he judged my case. He saw that my case was not uh, founded. My case was not uh, had no ground. I had no no evidence to support my case and he said no you are not uh, you don't qualify to be given the refugee status that was a person a case worker and i find out discovered that if this case worker is acting on in the name of the home office and he judges that i doesn't qualify to for protection it therefore means that the uk government does not accept me as uh, as, uh, that uh, my my case doesn't qualify as well, so I knew the government doesn't look into my case properly. I was I don't accuse the I don't I'm not pointing a finger at that particular person, but it's the government because that case worker stands there for the government. So I knew I was uh, left alone. So I had to touch various angles. I touched the I touched Amnesty International. I wrote to Amnesty International. I wrote to medical justice because I had medical issues as well that were not they did not the doctor in the detention center didn't rely on that so and that's an issue at the detention center the healthcare they don't really really take health issues in detention seriously just uh, about a month ago a lady died in Yaswood a Jamaican lady who was complaining that evening that she wasn't feeling well and they gave her paracetamol and sleeping pills. She passed away the following day. So all those type of things. I was in detention, I was complaining what I've gone through and all they did not take me serious until I had to involve medical justice in the issue and they sent an independent uh, doctor to check me up and they discovered that really I needed a surgery, which I went through that surgery and went through it again. I went through that particular surgery three times just to see the gravity of the of the problem that I had, which the doctor in detention did
did not take serious until an independent doctor came in, diagnosed the problem, and said I needed surgery. So health issues in detention is, is a problem. They don't care about it. What When you complain, they give you paracetamol, and that's it. You were, you were agreeing there, um, Dr. Canning, and you were writing something down. Is that the experience that you've seen in, in working with women in detention centres? Um, yeah, I think it is. What, what I was actually nodding with is is that there's, I think one of the key issues is there's a dissociation between what is happening outside of this country in conflict areas and areas of persecution and what is being recognised in relation to asylum and refugee lives in, in, in the country. I think there's a dissociation more generally in relation to the public and that can probably be related back to some of the um, myths and misrepresentations in the media, for example. Um, But also, you know, we see very individual stories of people who arrive um, in the UK seeking asylum. But I think there's that there's there's that kind of gears at an individual without recognising that this isn't that this is an individual story. But while it's unique it's not unrepresentative of what other people have been subjected to or the kinds of violence that people experience in relation to persecution in countries of origin. Um, so I think that's, that's one, of the, one of the key issues and possibly as well in terms of you know, the consciousness of people who are working in detention centres or people who are um, working with, as, as caseworkers with refugees as well more generally. What what legacy um, is the current policy on immigration, uh, asylum state, asylum seeker status, and refugee status, and the fast tracking of asylum seeker claims, and the detention of children, vulnerable women, um, and the misunderstanding of actually what an individual has gone through in their country? What I want to. Really, if you can sort of paint just a picture of what it is in Britain today, what people really don't understand. And, and, and with continued detention centres and the continued approach from asylum seekers to Britain, are we going to have in, in this country just a, a, an underclass of stateless citizens who have no rights and have no recourse to anything. Well, what do you, how do you see this, uh, Lisa Doyle, from your organisation? I think there is a general lack of understanding among the general public and politicians and policy makers across the board uh, about the experiences of asylum seekers and why asylum seekers are in the UK. We have a big debate taking place in the country at the moment around immigration in general, um, but that is really focused upon economic migrants, EU migrants, and the experiences of refugees and asylum seekers get swept into that debate without much of an understanding of the distinct experiences of this group of people who are forced migrants. Uh, They've not made a choice to to seek work in the UK. Uh, Asylum seekers have fled. They've fled for their lives and they have come to the UK to ask for protection from our government. And our government has signed up to the Refugee Convention in saying we are willing to to look at your your claim and give you protection and some of the uh, policies and processes were developed when there were many many more asylum seekers coming to the UK the the numbers have dramatically dropped over recent years although you know we could argue that conflict has not across the world but those who reach our shores to ask for protection uh, has gone down and and some of the these processes were designed at a point where they're the public discussions and political discussions about asylum were much more hostile than they are currently. And therefore, we we have a a legacy of of some processes like the Detain Fast Track, which are focused on speed and and on, you know, the desire to to get people processed and out or in and and making sure that, that people leave the country if their asylum claim hasn't been successful. But there is a, you know, a third of um, negative asylum claims that are overturned on appeal. And, you know, we need to think about whether the, the process is, is fit for purpose and, and does take seriously um, asylum seekers' need for good legal representation to, to bring together the evidence to show I am at risk. Because, as I, I said previously, 
um, the consequences of getting these decisions wrong are, could be horrendous for individuals if they're returned. But that's, that's going to be harder and harder with the cuts to legal aid, is it not? Sure. Um, asylum work is still in scope, which we are very, very pleased about. But actually, what has been cut is general immigration work. And lots of the good legal firms would cross-subsidise their asylum work um, from their general immigration work. And because you, know, you need a lot of time to, to pull together good evidence and... and we fear that what's going to happen is people can't get decent legal advice, which is essential at this point, and can't get access to it. And, and in some areas of the country, there'll be more um, law firms available than in others. And the general cuts in legal aid is affecting who is out there and available, who knows how to deal with asylum cases, who can support people to put the best claim in that they possibly can. Yes, I'm, I'm, we'll have a final point from you, Dr Kenning. Just going back to, to the original question, I think we can turn that question on the head, its head and just say, well, at what stage or at what point do we think that people fleeing persecution could be helped by the system the way that it is now? And of course it can't. Dispersal, forced worklessness destitution, living on £5.23 pence a day. You know, we see women walk into certain stores with, you know, two, three children because they can't afford the bus fare, you know, walking two, three miles because that's what they have been given. Um, that particular store's, you know, voucher. Uh, d- detention, um, the fear of forced return or refilement. How can living in these conditions help anybody who's been subjected to persecution or anything that would relate to or, or um, re- resolved in trauma? And that's the question that we need to ask. It doesn't work. There is a serious problem in the way that we are treating people who are fleeing um, conflict, persecution, torture in this country. And we may, we may not as a public generally recognise this, but it's time that we do because it is really a shame on, on us the way that we have responded. I'd like a final word from, from you, Kuka. And uh, with, you know, you talked at the, at the beginning about what you would like to change in your campaign. Yeah. And now you're a student at St Patrick's College studying health and social care. Sure. Finally, uh, the other panellists here have, have talked about the sort of individualisation and recognising, you know, people as an individual and understanding the conflict of where they've come from. What would you, what would you finally like to, to add to this discussion? Yeah, uh, Lisa and Vicky, they, uh, I really like the, uh, their ideas, their research and everything. They are talking on... The professional view of the issue, but I am talking as a person who've been through it, who witnessed it. So I will conclude by saying that the healthcare issue is very is something very important in detention, and there is this uh, thing they call uh, this document they call in detention Rule Thirty Five, which has been ignored for full. For, 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 for so long now, in about one in ten rule thirty five is accept nine are rejected. So and if you go back you see all these people coming to seek refuge, they have passed through they are war torn countries back, they have they have passed through certain things, maybe torture rape and all those type of things. So when they come here they really need to pass through health check and all the like. But when you go to detention, you say you need a Rule 35. The doctor just say, no, you don't qualify for a Rule 35. And that rules it out. You keep on suffering with what you, you have on you, all the illness you have on you. So if the government can look on this Rule 35 issue to be taken seriously in detention, that will be really, really good. And on that note, I'd like to thank all my guests. That was Kuka Ivu there, student at St Patrick's College where he's studying health and social care and a former asylum seeker from Cameroon. And Dr Lisa Doyle from the British Refugee Council and Dr Victoria Canning, lecturer in criminology at Liverpool John Moores University.
waiting for refugee status. Yeah, thank you for giving me the chance to say what I know about the refugee system in the UK, which I've been I've been through for a while. I left my country uh, because of the problems I was facing back home. So Britain was uh, I knew we knew in Cameroon that Britain was a uh, is uh, like a. Uh, the country, the country that colonized Cameroon, southern Cameroon, so it's just like our mother, or where we have to seek refuge. So I struggle to leave the country and find myself in Britain, where I seek as I ask for protection from the British government. But uh, unfortunately, is unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country. As of the beginning of 2012, the population of refugees pending asylum cases and stateless persons made up 0.27 of the population of the UK. That's 149,765 refugees, just over 18,000 pending asylum cases and 205 stateless persons. A new report called 28 Days Later, The Experiences of New Refugees in the UK – examines the transition period between when someone is granted refugee status and their asylum support ends. Today, an adult asylum seeker has to survive on £5.23 per day, which leaves many asylum seekers missing meals and unable to buy food. So what is life like being a refugee in Britain today? I'm joined by Kuka Ivo, an asylum seeker from Cameroon who spent four months in detention and is now a student at St Patrick's College studying health and social care. Dr Lisa Dorr from the British Refugee Council and author of the report 28 Days Later, The Experiences of New Refugees in the UK, and Dr Victoria Canning, lecturer in criminology at Liverpool John Moores University and coordinator of the Prisons Punishment and Detention Group at the European Group for the Study of Deviance and Social Control. Kuku Ivu, we're very grateful that you've agreed to come in to share your experience of coming to Britain. You're most welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Would you start then by talking through your experience of coming to Britain as an asylum seeker? You're listening to Radio VR, the voice of Russia in London with me, Juliet Spear. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UK received 23,499 new applications for asylum in the year ending in June 2013. In the UK, an asylum seeker is someone who has asked the government for refugee status and is waiting to hear the outcome of their application. A refugee is defined as a person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his or her nationality and is unable to, or owing to such fear. Fortunately, the day I asked for the protection, I was uh, I was detained that same day. So I went through the process for a period of four months. After release, I had to go through some uh, another period for about two months before having my uh, refugee status. That's from release to my refugee status, I was going to court. So I had to go through the period for about six months before actually being receiving the refugee status. So within this period, from detention to going to from detention going to court and having my status at the end of the day, it's been uh, it's been a long long journey. <laughs> 